We're considering Hamilton's variational principle, and so far I've been looking at the case where we have discrete systems, systems of discrete objects such as springs and masses and pendulums and so forth. Now we'd like to look at how Hamilton's principle can be applied to continuous systems. Discrete systems, we considered rigid, therefore non-deformable particle particles, and they were of order one size. But there's no reason why we could not apply the same principle, Hamilton's principle to systems involving infinitesimally small pieces of solids or fluids. So now these are continuous systems. They're deformable, so they can be compressed and expanded. And we'll be considering differential elements of, like I said, say a solid or a fluid. So let's first in this one slide remind ourselves of the developments applied to discrete systems. And I'll emphasize some of these aspects along the way that will then be different for continuous systems. So you'll see how they're the same and how they're different. So first looking at discrete systems, we have a finite number, capital N of particles. These are point masses, and there's a finite number of them. There's also a finite number of degrees of freedom, little n. They aren't necessarily the same, but they're both finite. And Hamilton's principle then for a conservative system looks like this. The variation of the integral of L, the Lagrangian is equal to zero. And then when we develop the Lagrangian, which is t minus v, we do that in terms of a discrete sum. So we sum up the t's and the v's, the kinetic and potential energies of each of the pieces, each of the particles that comprise the system. And because the particles are rigid and therefore non-deformable, the virtual work, the force acting through a distance, is only for external forces acting on the system. They typically result in ordinary differential equations of motion for the positions, angles, locations, particles in the system. Now, how does this look for continuous systems? So continuous systems now, we have bodies that are deformable. They're no longer rigid, so they can be compressed. You can strain them. And the mass is distributed throughout the body. So rather than point masses, the mass can be distributed throughout the continuous body. So we're going to apply Hamilton's principle, the same Hamilton's principle as before, but now to each of an infinity of differential elements that comprise the continuous system. So now capital N, the number of those elements, the number of quote unquote particles, is going to be infinity. So we have infinity of infinitesimally small pieces of the solid or fluid. So we will also have an infinite number of degrees of freedom. So big N and little n are both infinite now. And we need to sum over the entire volume of the system through integration. So rather than being a discrete sum, it's going to be an integral sum. So the way that looks is as follows. We have our Lagrangian, t minus v, just like before. But now that Lagrangian is going to be summed through integration, in this case through a volume integral. And this script L is a Lagrangian density. It's a Lagrangian per unit volume. This is comprised of a kinetic and potential energy portion, as before, but now per unit volume. So they're Lagrangian densities. Now in some cases it may be per unit length or per unit area instead of per unit volume, but in any case it's a, a density. Now because continuous systems are deformable, not only do we need to account for the effect of forces acting external to the system on the system, we also have to consider the virtual work done by internal forces that deform the system as well. So you'll see how that comes in. So let's illustrate the application of Hamilton's principle to continuous systems using a relatively simple example. And typically they will result in partial differential equations for the equations of motion as opposed to ordinary differential equations for discrete systems. So what we have is a string of length L. It's in tension. Capital P is the constant force of tension in the string. And then there's a lateral distributed load. F is a function of X acting vertically downward on the string. And that causes a deflection, v of x of the string. And it's, and it's this deflection that we're looking for in response to the p and the f of x. So x goes from 0 to capital L. And ds, as always, is a little differential element along, in this case, the v of x. Now we're going to make an assumption here, and that is that the transverse deflection, so v of x, is assumed to be small. And that results in really two simplifications. First of all, 
the gravitational potential energy, because of the deflection of the string, we're going to neglect. We're going to say that the deflection is so small that changes in gravitational potential energy are negligible. And the second consequence is that the tension P will be assumed to be constant. Normally, if you had a string in tension and you put a lateral load on it, that would increase the tension. But we're going to say that the lateral force F of X is small enough compared to the P that it doesn't change the P. And that's why it's a small deflection. So this is a one-dimensional problem in X. It's static, so nothing is moving. Therefore, the kinetic energy T is zero. So static problems always have T is equal to zero, and we only have potential energy. The Lagrangian then, L, is T minus V, but T is zero, so that's just minus V. And that's minus the integral over the length of the string of the potential energy per unit length. So the script V is potential energy per unit length of the string. And then we integrate to get the total potential energy along the full length of the string. Now, what are the contributors to the potential energy? Well, one is we are stretching the string because of the tensile force P. So that's a strain energy, U because we're just looking at little infinitesimal pieces, that'll be a small du. Then there's also a force times a distance, the work done by the lateral load, f of x, acting on each portion of the string. So f times v, and then times dx. So force times distance for each little dx piece of our string. And then that's per unit length to get our script v, so we divide by dx, and the minus sign here simply because it's down in the, the negative direction. So let's think about this du, the strain energy. Just like a spring, the strain energy is the negative of the restoring force times the elongation. The restoring force here is just minus p. So we're pulling in tension of p, so the restoring force is minus p. The elongation, is ds minus dx. This is the elongation for each little infinitesimal segment of the string. Its original strength was dx, and its stretch strength is ds. So the elongation is ds minus dx. Now we've seen ds before. It's just the square root of 1 plus v prime squared. And then that's minus 1 all times dx. So this is an expression for the strain energy in the string due to the fact that it's under tension. Now we could continue with this form of the strain energy, but we're going to take advantage of our assumption, our simplification, that the deflection v is small. If v is small, then the slope v prime is also small. You square it and it gets even smaller. So this term is smaller than this term. Whenever you see that, you should think of the binomial theorem. We have the square root of 1, plus something smaller than one. So the binomial theorem says the following. If I have the alpha power of one plus w, that's equal to one plus alpha w, plus additional terms. And this is a series expansion, goes on forever. But we're just gonna keep the first two terms. Alpha here is a half, that's the square root, and w, well, that's the v prime squared. So one plus alpha w, is 1 plus a half v prime squared. And then we're going to neglect all the smaller terms beyond that. So if you substitute this in here, the 1 minus 1, those cancel, and we just have the 1 half v prime squared times p. So that's an approximation for the strain energy of each little piece of our elastic string. So now we can substitute that in for du back here. And then remember, we had this minus f times v dx. So substituting that in, here's the 1 half p times v prime squared times dx, and then the minus f times v dx. This is our functional for the potential energy. This is the total potential energy of the string. And for statics problems, the physical principle, as we see in here in Hamilton's principle, is to determine the shape v of x that minimizes the total potential energy of the string. So we're going to take the variation of this and set it equal to zero to determine what the stationary function v of x is that minimizes the total potential energy. So we take the variation of our functional, the variation of something squared, 
is 2 times the something times the variation of the something. And then the variation of f, which is known, that's 0. And only v varies. So this is f of x times delta v. We use integration by parts to move the derivative off the delta v onto the v prime to get minus v pr double prime times delta v. The terms evaluated at the endpoints vanish because the boundary conditions, the displacements, are 0 at both ends. So we have an integral of this thing in square brackets with no deltas times delta v, where v is our dependent variable. So the thing in square brackets set equal to 0 is our Euler equation. You'll notice that it's an ordinary differential equation. Normally it would be a partial differential equation. But in this case, because it's static, it's not moving, it's not a function of time, it's only a function of x. So given the constant p, tension, and the distributed load f of x, we could integrate twice, put in the boundary conditions to get the v as a function of x displacement function.